they used to fetch the wool in on the wagons in the early day. My father was the teamster. And in later years, my brother had the mail run. And a fellow called Billy Egan, they went into trucks. And they had the old Ford, T-model Ford trucks to start off with them. I bought an Aramac in 1901. I remember the first car in Aramac and it was owned by Mr. Kingston. <laughs> It's been a long time since that first car, and we've seen a lot of changes in the way we get from A to B. Does that really stand for Aramac to Barcaldon? And who better to tell us about roads and the bush than Queensland's radio voice on the subject, the RACQ's Scott Nicholl. In the early days, pioneers blazed roads through cuttings just like this one, bringing in loads of building materials and goods and sending back precious bales of wool to the coast for export. Moving things in the West meant horsepower and bullock power. Lumbering bullock teams would haul loads of up to 30 tons over rough tracks for hundreds of miles. So heavily were the wagons loaded that they compacted the ground like concrete, leaving permanent raised ridges when rain washed away the softer soil. Although travel was tough, the pioneers were even tougher. Men like the patron saint of drovers, Nat Buchanan, blazed trails over hostile territory. Some say Buchanan was so tough he wasn't born, he was quarried. But Nat was a real softie at heart. When his wife was having trouble with her first pregnancy, Nat took her to Rockhampton by horse and buggy to get the best of attention. The trip took five weeks and on three occasions their tent was riddled with spears. In the 1920s, a gruelling event for motorcars was the 4,000 kilometre race from Brisbane to Burketown. These long distance races were staged on little more than goat tracks right through this district. Yet despite the rough conditions, they completed the journey amazingly in just 111 hours. Everybody knows about the legendary Ned Kelly. Aramac has its own legend, Captain Starlight. The Australian bushrangers came in several waves. The first bushrangers were ex-convicts, either escapees or convicts who were released on tickets of leave. Captain Starlight, he was an amalgamation of various different fictitious and real bushranger characters, mainly Harry Redford or Henry Redford and Frank Pearson. Pearson was an infamous highwayman. He used to hold up travellers and station owners in the remote areas of central New South Wales and western Queensland. Like most criminals, Pearson was a complex character. While bushranging was his first love, he also practised as a respected doctor in the Burke district of New South Wales. If anybody discovered him and offered fire, he wasn't unwilling to return it. Well, well, well. Australia's bushrangers were not folk heroes, as often depicted. They were almost always violent, ruthless criminals who preyed on rich and poor alike. They gave no quarter and expected the same in return. Get on your horse now! Frank Pearson was probably among the worst of a really bad bunch. He was an infamous horse thief and considered anybody's property to be his for the taking. Unfortunately, he had a similar attitude to human life. Pearson and one of his colleagues, Charles Rutherford, was involved in a huge big shootout at Erangonia, a pub called the Shearer's Inn. Unfortunately, two of the drinkers were troopers McCabe and McManus. <laughs> Pearson, too, was hit by gunfire, but stood trial for murder. 
because of all the smoke that was surrounding, he was able to escape. Although sentenced to death, he was reprieved and given life. Some say because he was the son of a European noble family. Pearson spent 15 years in jail where he became something of a talented artist. His paintings are treasured by the Sisters of Charity in Sydney. But he resumed a riotous life of crime on his release. In a twist of fate, this violent man actually died by accidental poisoning. Well, that's what happened to the first Captain Starlight. The other guy was a totally different kettle of fish, and he got up to a lot of his mischief just up the road up here. And this character behind me had a lot to do with his undoing. Harry Redford's a man that I don't think we know enough about, that we've not, uh, not learned enough about. People in those days, like Redford, they were very self-sufficient people, and they stole to survive. It was right. Harry Redford was a brazen thief. He had style. He didn't just steal the odd few cattle. He stole a herd of cattle from Bowen Down Station up near Roma and drove them through country that was previously thought to be impassable. He's portrayed as a very silent man. He never spoke about his cattle stealing, <laughs> understandably, I suppose. He was a big man. Harry Redford was a big man, big shoulders, and he's not the sort of person that you'd uh, want to cross. Harry Redford engaged Jim Arthur to go on the road on a droving trip, not realising that they were going on a cattle duffing expedition. Redford would have had to be a, a top bushman to have taken a thousand head of bullocks down that track in those early times and deliver them without having been lost or got off track. He pinched the cattle, no doubt about it, but he must have been a very smart and very knowledgeable man. When he stole the cattle, it had been raining, and that gave him a few weeks' grace. He knew there'd be water down the Cooper's Creek, and he knew enough to know that a few weeks' start would be all he needed. And when they assembled the mob, they headed down the Thompson River, down through the Channel Country, right down into Adelaide. There'd be times when they wouldn't know where the water holes were. It'd be one of the greatest feats that you wish to do. You'll remember me telling you about this guy. Well, he's the reason that Starlight came undone. Among the huge herd of nearly a thousand cattle Redford stole was a prize white bull. He was worth a staggering 500 guineas. And he wasn't going to have his lady friends in the herd take a trip into state without him. No matter how hard Redford tried to chase the bull away, it continued to follow the mob all the way to South Australia. Unfortunately for this cattle Casanova, Redford was running out of ready cash and sold the white bull to a squatter. Well, that bull was a dead giveaway, as it was famous for belonging to Bowen Down Station. The law was on to Redford in a flash. They soon linked him to the Bowen Downs cattle duffing. It didn't take long for the law to put two and two together and come up with four. Redford was put on trial in Roma, but by a comedy of errors in the evidence and a sympathetic jury, the sly fox was acquitted of the charges. I thank God the verdict is yours, gentlemen, and not mine. The judge had some scathing words for the jury, but Redford went home a free man. One good thing did come out of the Redford incident. 
Queensland adopted a central system of brand registration and on the 1st of May 1872, Bowen Downs registered their brand LC5. Above all else, Redford was a master bushman and his exploits are still recalled around many a campfire. He was the sort of man who'd poke authority in the eye at every turn. It's quite ironical though that a man who was so at ease with nature should die by accidental drowning. <laughs>